by a, a fairly forceful and sustained contact between Tanya's head and the car carpet. The DNA on the victim's bodies, the film of right with one of the victims on the night she disappeared, and this new forensic evidence meant the police were now confident of bringing murder charges. But waiting on remand in prison, Wright was still claiming innocence, even to his father. I had a letter from the prison to say that I'd been put on a visiting list by Steve, <coughs> and I made an appointment, and I went, and uh, went through the uh, arrivals, uh, and uh, then he declined to see me. <coughs> so I come away not having seen him. I wrote him a letter, and he wrote me one back. My head seems to be all over the place at the moment, so please try and sort this out. You say you want to help, so please do that one thing for me, but I don't know what he means. I've never, you know, explained. Wright's letter hinted at an unhappy childhood, something his father disputes. Whenever I get upset, I tend to bury it deep inside, which I suppose is not a healthy thing to do because the more I do that, the more withdrawn I become because I have seen so much anger and violence in my childhood to last anyone a lifetime. Now, I've tried to find out what this violence and anger is but I just don't know. I don't know what he's talking about. On the 14th of January 2008, Wright went on trial charged with murdering all five women. Any hopes that he'd buckle under the weight of evidence soon came to an end. Not guilty. He maintained his innocence throughout. By the time Wright took to the stand, we'd, uh, we were several weeks into the trial. Suddenly, you know, the tension rose and um, and it became incredibly interesting, of course, um, to hear what he had, to, he had to say for himself. It was the first time any of us had, had even heard him utter a word. There are a number of coincidences in this case. Are there not, Mr Wright? Are there not? It would seem so, yes. Well, let us consider just a few of them, shall we? There were 57 different coincidences which were put to him. Um, and to everyone, he gave pretty much the same answer, which was, it would seem so, yes. Shall we start with your DNA? That is another coincidence, is it not? It would seem so, yes. Because it would seem that your full profile is on the bodies of the three women who were recovered from dry land. Is that a coincidence? It would seem so, yes. It seemed to me that an innocent man would have attempted to elaborate a little bit more. Um, giving this same answer time and time again suggested he had something to hide. The coincidences kept coming. DNA profiles of the victims found on dry land were on Wright's gloves. The blood of Paula Clonell and Annette Nichols was found on his reflective jacket. And fibres from Wright's home were connected to four of the five bodies. The fact is, there are no coincidences in this case, are there, Mr Wright? The fact is that you murdered each of these women. No, I did not. It was a pretty nervy trial. We'd been under pretty immense pressure, and as we'd got towards the end of the, uh, the, end of the trial, that, that pressure just increased. You know, the weight of expectation was pretty immense, as you can imagine. But in the end, the jury adjourned for just six hours before delivering its verdict. Guilty, the serial sex killer and his campaign of murder. At half past 12, the gates of Ipswich Crown Court slowly opened. Led by three police outriders, the prison van carrying Steve Wright emerged. From behind the barriers came shouts of abuse. Scum, one man screamed. No! An evil killer incarcerated forever. Wright was now officially a serial killer and branded as one of the most evil men in Britain. His father, finding it almost impossible to accept, wrote to him one last time to get the truth. Myself, I don't believe and can't even imagine how any one person could have carried out five murders in so short a time. And quite honestly, I don't think you could even kill a rabbit. I, I just don't think there's enough aggression in him. If I had a rabbit in the garden, I said, I want, <coughs> can you go and wring its neck? He wouldn't be able to do it. Well, Steve, that's it from me now. If I get nothing from you, then I believe you are telling me something something 
I'd rather not hear. In other words, if he's guilty, he, you know, I was thinking, if he don't write, then he's telling me he's guilty. That was the way I wanted to put that across. You know, uh, well, I, he didn't write anyway. Wright's father may have found it hard to believe he was a multiple murderer, but others did not. And as more evidence about his past emerged, some were beginning to ask, had he killed even more? He went for us with a knife. He was so strong. He really was. He used to call himself the mean machine. Serial killer Steve Wright had been found guilty of the murders of five young women in Ipswich. But what made him do it? In the letter he sent to his father while on remand, he had talked of an unhappy childhood. But according to psychologists, a miserable past is no pointer to a violent future. It's all too easy to look to childhood events as the cause of bizarre behaviours like this. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, uh, they will not be a sufficient cause. Uh, most people have had unpleasant experiences in childhood, but they don't turn out to be serial killers. But other aspects of Wright's life do fit the profile of a multiple murderer. He demonstrated erratic behaviour, he drifted from job to job, and he'd been married twice. Serial killers very often have little to be proud of in their background. They have no career path, they have no stable relationships, they tend to be socially awkward, uh, perhaps uh, ordinary but a bit unpopular. After leaving school with no qualifications, Wright was pot-washing for the Merchant Navy when he met his first wife and moved to Wales. By the age of 22, he was working as a steward aboard the QE2, where he was to meet his second wife. I first met Steve um, in 80, 1984. He used to inundate me with flowers and presents, and he, he was quite a charmer, really. Uh, he had a very possessive streak, though very possessive, which I didn't like. When I went on QE, I'd been ashore once. I walked back to the ship with the shop manager, and when I got to the cabin, it had written on the cabin, slag, whore. I opened the cabin door and he said, you like to wire that much? There's your grass skirts. And he, he cut my skirts up into grass skirts, me uniforms. And then he went for us with a knife and he, whether he went to hit me with it, I don't know, but it stuck in the door. He was so strong. He really was. He used to call himself the mean machine. Descriptions of uh, Wright's behaviour from uh, ex-partners and relatives suggest that he did have a tendency to rage, which would spring up quite unpredictably, and that would suggest uh, a lack of restraint, a lack of inhibitory processes that might uh, prevent most people from acting out dangerous sadistic fantasies. Wright also displayed another typical trait of serial killers. His murder methods showed he knew how to dispose of incriminating evidence without leaving a trace. What it suggested potentially was somebody who had uh, awareness of forensic uh, issues and had perhaps taken time to remove any potential uh, discovery of, of evidence. Um, by placing uh, their bodies in water, it clearly reduced the opportunity significantly for us. By removing clothing, that potentially uh, reduces the opportunities. The fact that we didn't find any clothing clearly reduced our opportunities. Wright sort of fits the profile of a serial killer in every respect except age. He was 48 at the time of the Ipswich killings, and that is uh, amazingly middle-aged. Uh, by the usual standards of serial killing, where usually they have uh, begun their activities perhaps um, mid to late 20s or early 30s at the latest. But had Wright really left it until his late 40s to begin killing, or had he started earlier? Those who have delved into his background point to patterns of behaviour, unsolved deaths and methods of murder, all of which suggest that the number of his victims may be even higher than the official tally. On leaving the QE2, Wright married Diane, and they managed a pub in Norwich. Just as he would do in Ipswich, Wright moved into the heart of the city's red light district. It was frequented by sex workers, um, and he was known to many of, of, of those women. Um, it also emerged that uh, there were unsolved murder cases involving prostitutes um, 
uh, women who went missing, uh, and that obviously sent alarm bells ringing. The families of unsolved murder victims in East Anglia began asking questions about the so-called Suffolk Strangler. One of them was the father of murdered prostitute Michelle Bettles. Once Steve Wright had been arrested, and obviously then more information was being released, at that point, the wondering about was, or could he have been involved in Michelle's death, obviously became stronger because there was lots of connections you can put there. Tonight, we start with the continuing search for the killer of a young woman who worked as a prostitute in Norwich. Michelle Bettle's body was found in Woodland on the outskirts of the city three weeks ago. She'd been strangled, she was only 22, and she had three young children. In 2002, Michelle travelled to work in Norwich's red light district, not far from the ferry boat inn. Well, as far as you know, the last sighting was actually three days before Michelle was found. It's three days of her life that we've not got a clue where she was or what happened. Michelle had drifted into drugs, prostitution, everything else. In all, four prostitutes have gone missing since 1992.